I'll call the City Council work session of May 16th to order at 6 p.m. Uh, roll call, please. Mayor Copeland. Here. James Burton. Here. Ken Jones. Here. Jeff Gard. Here. Melina Meyer. Here. Ann Schaefer. Here. David Allison. Here. And James Weiss. Here. That's everyone. Okay, so the work session topic this evening is a Crater Lake Water and Power Project. And uh, before I turn it over to Manager Lanning and staff, um, I'm gonna pass the gavel to Councilman Schaefer, since uh, Councilman Allison's online, uh, to conduct the work session, uh, because I wanna recuse myself to the audience and um, is a representative of Cordova Electric, so I'm not involved in the city part of it. And then if there's any questions to the audience or any questions from council, I can answer them on CEC's behalf. So thank you, Councilman Schaefer. City Manager Lanning. Okay. As, as we've gone through this uh, project several times and the fact that we've talked about this during strategic planning, we've always portrayed that at some point, there's kind of a place where you have to make a decision whether you're gonna participate or not participate and what that level is gonna be. Early on, as you all know, the city committed $50,000 in funding uh, for the feasibility study. We had our staff uh, involved in the review of that and comment on that. And since that time, during my tenure, we have um, had a couple of meetings uh, regarding the project and future steps. Knowing that, I think we've tried to portray, or at least I've tried to portray, that at some point we were going to be making a decision very similar to this, and this is a stepping off point for us. Uh, always trying to keep the project in the place where we have a stepping off point. The feasibility study uh, or is complete and now on the geotechnical side of it, um, it sort of came at us fast and furious because of an opportunity that is gonna be here that will save us, save money on the geotechnical work. There are other funds from uh, the Radiance project that can be included and it really keeps costs down for everyone. Um, it was asked of me to bring this to you for funding uh, so that you can consider this and, and I wanted to take this hour of the work session to just have you folks um, ask questions and wherever your comfort level is on this. And in the um, resolution, as you can see, I gave you different levels that you could choose for funding, signifying your commitment at what level or not. And that decision is, is purely yours. You know, I think there are questions about what the value is to the city. Uh, Rich Rogers is here uh, to be able to address any of those questions because he has, uh, he was involved in the review of the feasibility study. So with that, I will leave it to you to ask questions and uh, see who can provide answers to you. So one of my questions that I had earlier was, yeah, how long would we see a return on investment on this project from the city's side? Um, yeah, when would we expect to see, and have we are we seeing a return on investment already at some of the other water projects that we've done, or, I don't know, what's our status in terms of water? Do we need more water right now? Is there a need for increased water? Right, right now, no. Um, you might want to go to the mics and give people on the phone. Okay. Right now, no. As far as the need for more water, our worst demands are during pink season in the summer. 
four and a half million gallons a day. We do that for a week or two, and our infrastructure now can provide that. All the reports I've gotten from our team is not once has somebody in Cordova had to pick up the phone in the summer and say, hey, where, where's my water? So all of demands, fish plants as well as residential commercial, when people call for water, open their taps in the summer, we're making it at four and a half million gallons a day from our three upland creeks. And, you know, um, we get a little nervous at that time because we have to have either a good snow melt or a good rainfall distribution of rainstorm uh, every couple days. If we have a two or three week dry spell during pink season, then we're gonna be under the gun. Uh, and so if, if our infrastructure in our city grows, residences, uh, businesses, or fish plants, uh, we probably can provide, you know, up 4.6, 4.7, maybe 5.0 million gallons a day. Um, we don't know yet, we haven't hit that limit. Um, our infrastructure can deliver uh, probably more than what we are now, as long as nature gives us the supply. Um, so, you know, we, uh, the need for that Crater Lake water is not here yet. Right now, that canyon, the Orca Creek watershed gives us uh, about one and a half million gallons a day in our feasibility study uh, and the briefing that we did two years ago um, shows that Crater Lake will give us another 1.8 million gallons a day. So more than doubling what we're getting from that canyon right now. We don't need it now, but in the future, we, we can get it if we need it. Yeah. So we're currently getting water from Crater Lake? Or we are. It feeds uh, Orca Canyon uh, behind Orca Lodge. Mm -hmm. We've had a, a, a water plant there for, for several decades. We just upgraded it in the last couple of years with uh, ultraviolet uh, reactors and a new building shell and some new valves and new SCADA. Um, and it trickles out of the lake. The canyons up there collect other rainfall and bring it down to a catchment. We have a concrete and gabion catchment up there at elevation 263 feet that forms a little pool that gives us a head of water that pushes down a pipe, uh, 10 inch, 10 inch, 12 inch intake down to our water plant right behind the Rainey's house. Uh, and we're very conscious of that because we're, we want to be good neighbors. They've been good neighbors. Uh, as we share real estate there on an easement. Um, so that gives us right now, we're getting, we're getting almost a, a million or half a million gallons a day from that plant uh, as we speak, one of our three plants. If we get a very fast rainfall, uh, turbid water, our water gets cloudy, it'll shut off automatically due to the high suspended solids. But usually that's a, it's a good clean water and that it's, it's uh, some of our best water coming out of that lake, coming out of that canyon. Um, what about um, Eak Lake? How often do we have to use Eak Lake water? We, we don't use it that often. For the past 11 years, we've averaged about 10 days a year using that. Um, in 2017 and 16, we didn't use it at all. This year, uh, we did use it. We used it. We had it on for 29 days back in um, March uh, due to uh, Murchison Creek, which our, another one of our upland sources over in that area was frozen up and we had no flow. And we, uh, we don't like to use Neal's Reservoir too much. It's our back, uh, it's our backdrop and it's, uh, it's it's in a swamp up there. You know, it's good water, great water, but not not our best. So we had it on for 29 days, but the average is 10 days a year. Now that plant is 35 years old. Those plants are designed to be run almost 24/7, and we've only we only run it for 16 hours a day for about average of 10 days a year. So it's underutilized. It's good to have, but when we use that plant, uh, there's four pumps that take out of the lake. Uh, that plant only gives us about a million gallons a day. And uh, it has to, it pushes water up to the same tank that Murchison Creek uses. Um, so we can't, and we can't have both, of, both those sources going at the same time because they both go up to the same tank, same pipe. So if Murchison Creek is flowing good, 
I can't, I can't turn on Yak Lake, even if the other sources dry up, but it's a little balancing act there. Mm -hmm. we, we gave this a little um, a briefing after the feasibility study report, which is now, I think, uh, coming up on a year and a half, two years old. And I can do this again sometime, or I can send it out. Um, just, it, it's got some numbers in it that are kind of confusing, unfortunately, but as far as shows that we don't really need it now, but if, if the bottom line at the end is, you know, if we want growth in Cordova, then we're probably gonna need more water, um, unless nature is real good to us and gives us exactly, you know, either a good snowpack every year or a rainstorm every four or five days that will take care of our increased growth. Or if we want no growth, then we just use what we have. We, we, we will not need more water from Crater Lake. Have other water sources been examined? Alternatives? The, the, the feasibility study uh, did some of that. We've been on wells before in the city. There uh, are a couple small ponds up in, in uh, on some high ground around here that have been looked at but nothing um, could give the volume with the, uh, that Crater Lake offers with the bowl. It's in a bowl up there, so it collects rain, collects snow. So from a water point of view, um, no. And, you know, desalinization is very, very expensive. I uh, don't really wanna, probably don't wanna look at that. Would there be a lot of cost into taking the lake water and using a different because you talked about how you, if you use the lake water, you can't use the other reservoir that you have. Is there a way to separate yeah. that a little bit so you could get that half a million gallons and process water from the other? Um, that's that's an interesting. That's an interesting thought. We um, over on that uh, out Copper River Highway, as you know, where the EAC plant is, that's where Murchison Creek comes down. So we would have to set up a separate pipe and a separate tank and run that pipe all the way into town, build a new tank and a new pipe to make use of both those resources at the same time. Um, because both those, as I say, both those sources go to the EAC plant and there's only one line going up to one tank. And right now, um, if I have the lake on, then I can't push up the water coming from Murchison. If I have, if Murchison's flowing, then I can't, I can't fit all the water in there at one time. So I'd have to build another like 12 inch pipe and a tank, uh, a pipe to the tank, and then run a line uh, into town. We are, we have two lines now in the highway, which we dug up last week. You saw part of that, you know, it's eight feet down. We'd be we'd be putting a pipe like that in the ground all the way back in. So, and you know, I haven't haven't talked to people about that. Haven't studied it. You're the first person that's asked that question about how can we how can we get both of them to work. So that's a real uh, un unstudied answer. But that's my first rough guess. How would you rate the lake water the way you talk about? The ones out there. Or are the best, probably, water, right? It's our clearest water out there. Um, and lake water, we run through filters and we have uh, charcoal and uh, chemicals to affect, to, to clean up uh, any visual or odor to meet, to meet drinking water standards. So, you know, and it, you hear stories around town, people don't like the lake water. Well. Um, when we're when it comes to our treatment system, it's 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 okay. And like I say, we we had it for we ran we drank it this year for 29 days, and it was it basically served a third to a half of our city consumption. A third to a half of our water during that time was from Yak Lake, and I didn't I didn't get a phone call. We didn't get phone calls saying you know I smell the water. I know you guys are on it, which usually happens. A couple years ago, we went out to the public. We put out an announcement. Hey. You know, we're going to go to Lake Water for the next couple of days, and you know, you could. We got phone calls and we got gripes, but we didn't say anything this time. And hey, nobody, nobody said anything. So. Didn't I say something? <laughs> I don't recall. Okay. <laughs> so we're 
have the potential of a road going in out to Humpback Creek here now. Um, has anybody looked at water from Humpback Creek? Not recently. Um, one one source option from a, st a couple of studies of earlier of a decade ago was you know running a line out to Middle uh, Middle Middle Fork. What's it? Middle Arm. Middle Arm. Middle Arm across the lake over because they say that's good water. Humpback Creek water supply. I don't know. Clay might have uh, know because of the work they did there with hydroelectric. Uh, they, I'm sure someone probably at that time said, hey, they pipe it in from there, but not recently. I don't even know if it was mentioned in the feasibility study from two years ago. I don't know if you or Clay would be a better one to ask this question to, but do we know what we're looking at for a dollar's amount to get this water for future? How much the city would be putting in? Um, Roughly, um, it's uh, roughly a, at the 50% number, 50-50 uh, split. I think it's just under that. It's in the feasibility, it's the feasibility study report talks about a, a cost split. Yeah, that, that was addressed. I, I think some of this is developed on a 50-50 cost share. Um, since I've been here, I think what we've talked about is the cost of the project and the value to the two different, or to the entities involved, speaking of the city and CEC, for example, if 60% of the benefit was in the electrical production, uh, we, we would at some point develop an agreement between the entities that would state uh, our benefit, and that would, uh, I think, accrue to or associate with our investment. I don't know that it and that that's around the project is is about a, a eighteen or nineteen million dollar cost. So split that in half. That's what we're looking at, roughly in half, nine million, nine or ten million dollars uh, capital costs for construction. Um. Ms. Rainey and Arthur Lodge have, uh, have had a lot to say about uh, just pending dangers associated with the dam above their property. What does a geotechnical study do to shed more light on that? A geotech study is going to um, uh, drill, I believe, about 10 holes in the ground, four, I think four or five up at the dam. Uh, one up at the um, a Crater Lake Fault, the visual fault that's up there running across the lake. Three down below, down at the treatment site, down at her level, uh, roughly the level of Orca Lodge. And uh, one or two along the uh, Penstock route down the hill, and then several test pits, shallower test pits. So geotech study goes down and they're down to about 50 foot depth, looking at rock cores, if, if they're whether we're in rock, it looks like most of them will be in rock up there. Um, and and the, the geotech guys look at these, they pull these cores out and they look for, you know, weak zones, uh, junctions, uh, uh, some geologic uh, fracture or potential fracture that would either a slip, a crack, or a very permeable that would allow water. So that's that's what that does. and. It's it's kind of it's pretty valuable. It's required, obviously, for dams. Yeah. That that geotech evaluation is is uh, being requested by CEC this summer. In the past couple of months, um, and it's most part of it's on most of it's on city property, so. CEC has come to the city with a request for a land use permit to go up there this summer with uh, these drilling crews and do this work at selected sites at a base camp down below and then up on top in the mole where the dam, the footprint of the dam will go. And we have reviewed their request uh, two times and uh, looking at it from the landowner's perspective, 
they're on city property. That's that's a controlled watershed, one of our unfiltered sources, because the drilling they're going to do is is in or very near to the the little canyon up there that captures our drinking water for Orca. That that million and a half gallons a day that we definitely need from that plant come July 15th through August 15th, roughly. So you can imagine drillers up there, uh, a couple drill rig, one, maybe two, three drill rigs crawling up on a, on a skid trail, possibly maybe a base camp, partial base camp up there. So we've been concerned and we've given uh, requirements back saying we're, we're not going to agree to this work until you guarantee us, assure us in your project documents that your contractors and your inspectors and your geologists are going to keep a clean site. No, no runoff, you know, have measures in place to control erosion, stormwater runoff, oil spills, uh, human waste, you know, trash waste, whatever, not in the watershed because if we as a, if we as a community allowed some accident up there to force us to shut down Orca, I lose a million and a half gallons um, in July, then I have no other source but to count on Beals Reservoir also giving us one and a half million gallons, and then Murchison, either Murchison or Yak Lake, giving us one and a half million gallons. Oh, we'll lose a third of our city water supply if that happens. So Clay and Craig have, you know, resubmitted again, uh, and we've given comments back with their geologic firm and their their contractors that they're going to hire to do this, saying, hey, you, you got to have a you got to have a pretty clean operation because we can't let this watershed um, be a shutdown. Hey, uh, Rich. Yes. I've got a few questions. Uh, one of them would be, I guess, you know, if we do partner CEC, who would control the storage and the, and the, and the flow, you know, um, who controls when the water gets spilled, I know. CEC wants to generate energy, they're going to want to spill water, but, you know, we want to keep our storage, or um, if we need water and they don't want the extra energy, I'm just curious how that would work. Yeah, that's a good question. Good question. I, I don't, I haven't thought through it. I don't think the feasibility study did. Uh, I'd like to defer to Clay, but he pulled himself out of this conversation, so I don't know if he can answer that, but, you know, um, I hope our, co our relationship would be cooperative enough where we would say, hey, you know, the people of Cordova need drinking water uh, today or this week, and they don't need it for hydro, but we got to open the, we got to use Cradle Lake water. Hopefully, CEC would say, okay, you know, we, we got to reach, and, and vice versa. If, C if the people of Cordova need electricity, cheaper electricity from that pen stock, and I don't need the water for drinking water. Um, hopefully we'd have no objection to them opening the valves for to make some electricity. Do we have any yeah, idea? Yeah, I was curious to be able to make that call. Uh, another question, the, you know, currently that water comes down, it's gravity fed into a little collection, and then that builds your head pressure so you can Get it, you know, get it down and get it down. There's, there's no pumping involved, right? That's correct. So then, if you use this water to run turbines uh, to generate electricity, it's going to take a lot of momentum out of the water, and, and you're going to have to pump it back up into the city's, uh, into the city system. Is how I was understanding it. Um, and I was curious who would pay for for pumping that water back up. Um, you know, that takes electricity to, to pump it, so it seems counterproductive to generate electricity just to pump it back up. But uh, you're, you're right in that running that water through the turbines takes the energy out of it. Uh, it is true, it's got to be pumped. I think it was, it was discussed at length in the feasibility study uh, as far as how much we anticipate that. Uh, it's a, a rather minor amount of electricity each day to do that, and um, off the top of my head, I, I, don't, I don't recall a discussion about who's going to pay for that. I, I got to defer to Clay. I may remember. I don't know. Are there any more comments on the phone? There is a chance. 
Go ahead. <clears throat> Along the same lines as what uh, Ken just asked, in the period of time, let's say that this goes forward and there's a dam constructed and, and uh, what, what happens during the time we're waiting for that thing to fill up? Do we totally lose um, the water supply that we're relying on now? Uh, let's see, for the dam to fill up, uh, however long that's going to be, um, a year or two or three, roughly. Uh, well, we still, no, we still, like, we're still going to have a pipe coming out of that, uh, coming out of the, uh, lake. We have an existing water treatment plant that, if this project goes, will be the guts of it will be transferred over to the new treatment building. Um, I think I think in the construction process there'll there'll be a way where we can we continue. We pretty much will have to allow for our current orca plant to keep to stay functional um, with a minimal minimal switchover time for key components. Um, you know, so that we don't lose, um, we could, uh, we, we have backup with Meals Reservoir to use Meals for a week or so in the summer. We could shut down Orca for a couple of days or a week and, and use, get water from elsewhere, but we'd have to keep an eye on the weather conditions. But Meals Reservoir gives us about a, five day, five to six day, or more backup source if we lost Orca, if we had to shut Orca down for construction, during construction. Right, my question was more, more along the lines of making sure that we weren't going to have to stop utilizing it uh, in order for this to take place. Yeah, I, uh, um, Rainstorms would, uh, you know, keep flowing to the existing Orca plant. We could set up pumps during the dam construction. We could set up pumps to take water out of Orca um, if we can't use a, a temporary pipe through the dam to keep our current plant going. I th I think your your question can be addressed without too much difficulty. When we, you know, when you get to the point of telling the contractor that they gotta, here they have to maintain a certain amount of flow during the work to our current plant. Uh, I think it's, I think it's doable. Right. Well, okay. The issue is important because construction season and fishing season uh, happen at the same time. So mm -hmm. there's a reason I asked that. I wanted to make sure that we weren't going to have interruption if this is something that even. You know, takes place in the next couple of years or whatever. Thanks. Welcome. I, I do have one one other question. Uh, I guess I'm just curious. You know, you said you're we're getting a million to a million and a half per two days. I, I believe I got that right. We're getting a million and a half from each of our three mountain sources. Yes, uh, at peak at peak demand, right? Okay. And so that 18-inch pipe that's underneath the Orca Cannery Road, um, it be able to handle the increased capacity you're expected? Yeah, that's a, the existing pipe is 16-inch ductile iron. It serves as a contact tank. It has for several decades because it's like a big linear storage tank. The, the choke points that we're more concerned about in our infrastructure throughout the city are our 12-inch uh, valves, 10-inch valves, and 8-inch valves as, as the network gradually brings water from our tanks down to the fish plants, mostly from Morpac tank. And, uh, you know, you can, we can run a model. You can run, try to run models of your existing infrastructure and plug it into these computer programs or do it by hand the old fashioned way. And they're really estimates as to whether you're gonna have any choke points or not. Uh, I think um, 
but I don't think we're going to have any. We're, we're going to have to find that out by um, an increased water demand. And, and someday when we're flowing more than we are now, um, somebody's going to say, hey, I'm not getting enough water. And we're going to realize there's a choke point. It's uh, we can spend for a network analysis. We have it on our our, our unfinished or unfunded request right now for forty thousand dollars. I can I can have an engineering firm run some models of our existing infrastructure and try to find where we may have a choke point that we haven't found yet, but but numerically it might appear. Uh, and you know which 10 inch valve or because we have a lot of you know 90 degree angles new pipe jo joining old pipe every time there's a change of direction we have a energy loss uh, but it won't be uh, dealing with that that 16 inch pipe uh, going under Orca Road the feasibility study did say did recommend that they we increase the size of a pipe running uh, from the base of Norpac Hill up to the tank there's a pipe junction at the base of that hill. I believe that's several, that'll be several hundred feet of uh, in, increased pipe diameter. But other than that, um, and that was included in, in the cost of this project. Other than that, there's you know no, no other known choke point yet. So I've got a couple small questions. Um, so we've got a project we're looking at for benefits for all the citizens in the community and the risk would be shouldered by basically a family or a family business. Um, so what kind of risk assessment analysis have we done in this and what type of dam structure are we looking at? Are we looking at an earthen dam with you know, a riprap face on it or what kind of dam construction are we looking at or have we even got to that in this? It's not, not designed yet, uh, the, the details of the dam. No risk analysis, I don't think we've, we've done. I mean, the feasibility study did not do that as far as you know safety analysis of people under the dam and we been looking at doing those kind of analysis how far down the road into the project would it would that be something that we'd be doing in the geotech stuff? No, no i think uh i think that would be probably required by uh maybe required by the state dam office saying, you know, you, you got to do some, some safety. Well, risk I understand, but what I'm trying to figure out is how far into the project, how much money are we going to spend before we get to the, prep, to the point where we could do an assessment like that to know whether, you know, what risks we were shouldering and who we're having shouldered. I don't know. I can't answer that question right now. I see. See Clay for help, but he's. <laughs> well, uh, can he? Can you? Yeah, I just I actually was leaving the, the uh, council table so that I could speak from seats. Okay, that's what I thought. But um, I'm kind of capturing the questions here that I kind of feel for a little more right now. Okay. Which is which is when he's he's catching most of it. So. Okay. Mom, that's my two little simple easy questions. Thank you very much, Rich. Yeah, thank you. Are there any more questions for Rich? Um, say, saying that we're meeting our needs right now, the water demand, what value is this to the city? That we're meeting our water yeah, demands now? If we're meeting our water demands now, what value is this to the city? Um, future growth. And, and again, uh, I don't know when that's going to kick in, because right now we're we're, we're, we're meeting what the city needs in our crunch times. And uh, if, if the city's demand were to increase from 4.5 up to 5.0, I'm, I'm, we, we have a real good chance of making that now. I, it's hard to put a number on what our total capacity is. 
we provide 4.5 million gallons a day now. I don't know what, what our system can, can push out because it's based on everybody opening their taps at the same time and letting the whole thing drain. So when will we need more than what we have? I don't know, I think, you know, 4.5, 5, 5.5. 5. Uh, I, I, I don't, I can't put my finger on a number that says, this is when I'm gonna get a phone call from, from Ocean Beauty saying, we're not getting the water we need. Uh, you know, I don't, and that's when we need Crater Lake. That's what Crater Lake will, will would kick in. Do you have do you have figures showing like our water usage through the years and how it's raised? Like now it's at four point five a day. Is what you were saying? But like how long ago is it at four point oh, or when it yeah. be projected to be at five point oh, for example? Yeah, we, we do. Our growth in the last fifteen years is about four percent a year, four percent consumption increase per year, and we we do have a whole bunch of all sorts of data on that. And if that's that would be helpful, we I can you know we can get some of that. Did someone have a comment on the phone? Yeah, uh, I was just curious if they've done any cost analysis on if our water rate and property taxes will have to increase in order to pay for this this uh, nine million dollar city portion. No, we haven't done that yet. Uh, as far as how um, yeah, how we pay for future infrastructure, let's see, uh, enterprise fund, water is an enterprise fund. Um, yeah, I, one, one option of funding it would be increased rates. There are other, there are other, other funding options which we, you know, we look at every time we look at a new project. We borrow money, we get a grant, we get a, we do a bond, uh, we dig into savings, or we we bump up rates. Haven't made that decision yet. If you look in the budget on pages 178 and 179, included in your budget were rate analyses on the various enterprise funds, and it shows um, what the current rates plus an additional 10%, 20%, and 30% would look like. Um, not not um, anticipating that those costs would cover, you know, the bond involved, but we do have that rate analysis to some degree in the back of the budget, and we could, we could certainly expand upon that to uh, based upon a uh, participation rate, give you that number, what it would cost to cover, but um, so. What is the rate for household for water? Yeah. Oh, it's what, 49, somewhere between 43 and $49 a month. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, right now, our rate structure every year brings in for the water department about a million dollars uh, fees, water fees. So if our fees go up 10%, we're gonna bring in another 100,000. Okay, well this project's gonna cost us eight million. Well, you know. 10% in debt service. $8 million project is $800,000 payment. Approximately. Yeah. So we have to double rate in order to pay for it through a rate hike. Well, I think how to pay for it is yet to be determined. Um, you know, I I would say that that's probably the best bet is through a rate hike, uh, obviously, but um, um, we, I, I don't think I've done the math on that yet, what that would exactly look like. It depends on our participation level. Hmm. Yeah. It kind of sounds like it looks, kind of sounds like $3.50 a day for water. That's what it looks like, right? 
That's, I mean, for a common household. What, I don't know the percent. No, no, if you double it. <clears throat> Excuse me? If you double it. It's $49 a month. Yeah, right yeah. It's a buck and a half a day right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the impact of doubling people's water rates, mm -hmm. that's that'll be certain to get some attention. <laughs> um, I have a couple questions. Do we know how much our residential household demand is for water and what our commercial plants are? So would this be planning for the future for another plant coming into Cordova that would need that extra water or residential? Yeah, that's 30 to um, thirty to 40 percent. Residential. Split out between residential and, and uh, 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 fish plant and other. And our storage tanks are, how much are they to build? Do we need bigger water storage tanks? Would that help with the water demand or? We have six tanks now that currently store for us 4 million gallons of water. So, you know, if we were really in trouble in the summer, they'd, they'd go dry in a day or two. Um, they, uh, Are they in good the, shape? The, they're, they're in good shape. We just, you know, last year, part of LT2, we, we uh, renovated four of them. Uh, two interior and exterior and two exterior for coatings, protective coatings. Um, and I, um, you know, there are a million, million or more, a couple million dollars a pop for a, a equivalent tank, that's what we have. And uh, I, I haven't done the math on, you know, whether one, one or two more would help us or not. It never hurt, but they're not, they're not going to help us. I don't think they're going to, you know, if we're not getting water from, we're really subject to. The, the bounty of timing of nature. And our backup is, is Eak Lake, and if that were our only source, we'd be getting one million gallons of a day from Eak Lake, maybe one, one and a half. But yet our demand is four and a half in the bad time of summer, so that's a bad place to be in, you know? But that would happen if we, if we had a drought summer and we had no snowpack melt, our creeks wouldn't be giving us water. We'd be stuck with the Yak Lake. That's when the phone calls would start coming from Ocean Beauty and Trident North and everybody down low saying, where's our water? They said, we can't give it to you. All I got is the Yak Lake. And that's only a million and a half a day. That's a third of what the city needs. So if another plant came to Cordova, a large processing plant, how much water, more water would we need? Well, um, I think our plants now on, a, on that worst day, worst days of the year, they're using uh, one and a half to two million gallons a day. That's six of our plants. Granted, they're different sizes. Together? Yeah, all together. All together. Um, so another plant might, might use uh, half a uh, 0.3 MGD or half a million gallons a day all by itself in that ballpark. There are about 14 more minutes left. Um, are there any more questions for Rich or? Can I just clarify water rates? 29.58 yes. a day for a single family. Thank you. So like a buck a day. Buck a day? Yeah. Yeah. Double that to two. Those all those current monthly rates are on page one seventy eight in the mm -hmm. in the uh, the back of the budget, and the highest rate is for like bar with the restaurant for every twenty five seats, you know those kind of uses. So for a single family twenty nine fifty eight at thirty eight, which is nine dollars, uh, produces nine hundred thirty eight thousand in revenue, which is about a two hundred per. Two hundred thousand dollar increase. So it, it would probably, it, it would at least, if you were calculating our contribution on a payment seven or eight hundred thousand, it would double the rates for single family. Okay. Yeah. Thank you.
Does anyone, yeah. Did you want me to speak to a couple of those or? Yeah, sounds good to me. Yeah, I have some questions about okay. So I'll just try to run through these uh, real quick. Um, who controls the flow? Uh, that's a good question, and that's probably one of the more complex parts is um, when you need water, you need uh, electricity. Right now, it's pretty straightforward because you need both at the same time. The two systems compete with each other right now because they, they operate, they have excess water or not enough for the same reasons. If it gets clear and cold out, our reservoirs start getting drawn down with nothing feeding into them. Our run of the river hydro is quit producing. So just when um, the city is having to be forced to use water from Eak Lake, we're at our highest diesel and our electric rates are double or triple. Last couple of months we've been having a lot of complaints because fuel prices are up from last year and we had a, you know, a normal cold spring in March and April and you see that on your electric bill, it can double. So right at the time when CEC is running short on energy, we have the city throwing a couple more you know, we haven't thrown more load on us, and it's just adding to the diesel we're already burning. So two things, it's forcing us to use more diesel, and it's their electricity is a much higher cost. So they kind of fight each other right now. Uh, a big storage tank um, complements, because right when the city needs water, because water system's drying up, we need the energy. So we can trickle it out a little bit at a time and still save diesel. Doesn't matter whether we produce, you know, if we produce the maximum the project can produce or just produce a couple hundred kilowatts, we still have, Crater Lake won't make up all the diesel that we have left. It'll only make up about a third or a fourth of the diesel that we're still burning. But we can use it very strategically for energy. So we can let it out a little bit at a time or a lot at a time when the city needs water and it's still gonna all offset diesel generation. There's probably gonna be a little bit of times, I estimated 5% of the time maybe where one or the other would need water or energy. So, but on the front end, there's a really high correlation, so that's good. Um, and that's part of the other message is that they both get a little more efficient. As far as the pumping goes, you're dropping at 1,600 feet, and then you're repressurizing a little bit. So just thinking of it as you getting eight or nine units of energy out of the water, and then using one of those units of energy to repressurize it, set it down the line. And we initially looked at that as just a plant operating cost. In other words, CEC wouldn't build the city for that. It would just like a, look like an energy loss to us. And that, that's going to happen. You know, we could move the elevation of the project lower and get more energy out of it, but then we just have to pump it harder. So, uh, but if you're releasing, you know, five gallons a minute through the project, and you're only using two gallons a minute to go to the city, um, then you're only using a part of the energy. So at the end of the day, it's fairly small and it's not something we'd bill for. Um, at least uh, we, don't, we haven't made those arrangements, but that was uh, the thought process so far. Um, the operations and maintenance is a really important part. One of the huge advantages on the electrical side, and I would guess on the city, is that, um, you know, as you heard, uh, metal tanks have to be maintained. And two million dollars for one million gallon tank uh, Crater Lake is three to four hundred million gallons of storage, so that's enough energy to equal several hundred uh, two million dollar lithium ion batteries, for instance, or over a billion dollars worth of batteries. So you're close to a billion dollars worth of steel tankage to store as much water as Crater Lake can. So there's a certain security element in having that much energy in, in a very, very clean water source, storing that resource for when you need it. And that's the other thing, it's, it isn't just um, whether we get more demand in the summer, it actually creates an opportunity to have more water and more energy, lower cost energy available in the winter. So that's one of the advantages, but um, even with the very highest, uh, the very biggest dam storage in the 20, 28 to 30 foot uh, level, even if you built it at that, the whole lake would fill up and, and drain twice, in other words, you almost have twice that much water going through the system a year as what you would be storing. So it isn't like you'd have to wait years for it to fill up, either in your in your uh, fall rains or your spring runoff, that, that alone is gonna fill it up. And you actually kinda need to use that water to get the value of it before it fills back up again. Um, 
So choke, choke points, just to be clear, that, that big water line out there would pass, would be able to pass that full, you know, 2.89 um, million gallons a day. So there's no choke, choke points in that big line. And that's, that's the expensive part. That's like three miles, right, from Oregon to town. Um, that's one of the advantages too. CEC has a lot of transmission line capacity that goes right through there into town. So you don't have to build the transmission water or power lines, which is usually a real expensive part of projects. Um, so risk assessment, uh, hydros are, it's something you don't really talk about because it's not only is it just assumed that it's gonna be uh, built to a standard, but that's the primary regulatory concern. There's three hazard classes. You know, low hazard, medium hazard, and high hazard. And high hazard is just determined by are there people downstream? Are there people and structures downstream that could be damaged? So if you, if you like Google uh, Blue Lake and Sitka, for instance, the entire Silver Bay, Cannery, all the industry and everything is right downstream of their dam. But it's several hundred feet high where they have hundreds of pounds of pressure. We're talking about a dam that's going to be 35 feet higher, 30 feet higher, 10 feet high, and have, you know, 10 to 20 pounds of pressure. So um, that being said, because of concerns of the landowner and because of the regulatory requirements, um, the risk assessment is something that has to be mitigated through the design process. But uh, given the landowner's concern and frankly CEC's unfamiliarity in the cities probably of managing a storage project, um, that's an element we've actually been discussing and we need to um, have those discussions with Rainey's, especially if we go forward with this work in the summer. And that answers the other question about, uh, that was a good point about the geotech. That's one of the reasons you do the geotechnical to see what is the strength of the rock, uh, what might be the weaknesses, and what, what is the risk that you would have even, you know, introduce the potential for landslides or something after you destabilize the slope. So um, I would anticipate doing some risk assessment and there, there are extra safety layers that you can add, uh, I hope at fairly low cost that can actually exceed regulatory requirements that might help, um, um, you know, allay community concerns. And believe me, it, it isn't just, um, it isn't just the adjacent landowners, it's any citizens that happen to be in the area. We don't wanna wash out roads or uh, endanger human life. Um, so as, as far as the payment, uh, just like this um, geotechnical assessment, um, the attractive thing about this project is that you have two value streams. So you can share in the operations and maintenance through the life of the project, which is very long life. And uh, you can share in the cost. I think this project has a fairly good chance of getting, I think it may even require funding. It's a big financial lift for the community to uh, undertake a project like this. We've been successful in getting uh, federal and state support for these types of projects in the past. I would think we'd almost have to get a pretty high level of uh, assistance with this project to make it pencil out for us. And uh, the long term pencils out easily, it's just, you know, coming up with the money and, and putting that burden on the community now to build it, so. Um, I, I just add that we don't have everybody connected to the water system in the city. I'm one of the people that doesn't have water service. My, my water bill is almost $200 a month because I have a well that I have to operate and maintain. I'm on my second well pump in 20 years. I'm on my third wat, uh, water softener system in, in 20 years. I have to add salt, I have to change filters, I have to pay for the electricity to pump it and filter it. It's not as good a quality, frankly, as the city's water. I would love to be connected to the city water system. And uh, I don't think a lot of people have actually done the math on how much it costs to run your own water system, but it's, it's very expensive. And believe me, there's other things I'd rather do with my time as well, so. Um, so that's, I think I got most How about controlling the flow of water? How we determine when water is let out and who controls that? If we were to have a demand call yeah. and say, gosh, we need water today, how would we? Because we had talked about that during one of our meetings, I think we, we had discussed. So I think to, for the most part, we can do it. I'm, I'm hoping we can do it automatically. The water system has a control system that it can call for water. That same call can be dispatched to the Cordova Electric's control system and say, hey, run Crater Lake now, that just becomes one of the, the logic 
decision makers in our, and so, and fortunately water isn't something that you have to do at light speed like electricity. So if we can get like a half hour notice or something, I mean, let me put it this way, we respond in seconds to those requests with our power system. Uh, I think it'd be pretty easy to, to automate that. So, and, and because of the way this hydro is structured is fairly small energy uh, supply, it's really structured to be a water supply that we just harvest the energy from as the city needs water. That's really the way to think of it. It was actually kind of a city uh, looking for various water sources. Oh, that was the other one. We did look at Humpback Creek. Um, it's a very clean source most of the time. Uh, we've tested it three times and basically DEC said you can drink it right out of your pipeline because we have a bunkhouse out there. It gets really turbid, just like kind of Crater Lake does when there's high flows. But um, that road, the only thing is you're looking at, you know, a couple, three miles of pipeline because the CEC catchment is at the bottom of a canyon to have to somehow get it up and over. But um, it absolutely has the potential and there's so about 8 billion gallons goes through the Humpback Creek watershed and only about a half a billion goes through the uh, Crater Lake watershed. So that there is potential, but it would be fairly costly and you don't get the energy benefit from it. So. <coughs> is there any other questions? Or? Okay, thanks. Well, I actually had one question about the um, height of the dam. Have yeah. you... Is a really large dam necessary rather than maybe like a six foot dam so for energy? What happens is the bigger the dam is, the more water you can store at once. And that's not just to get just for a season, but it's also to carry through to another year if you have to. So it's kind of like having a, I don't know if it's even a good analogy. It's just like the gas tank in a car. You know, you, you can increase the project with a very low dam might be in the 13, 14 million dollar range. Um, the project with a high dam, you know, in the 18 to 19 million dollar range, um, I don't think the gap's even that much, but um, the storage is what's critical on the energy side, especially. Uh, we don't have any energy storage anywhere on our system, so we spill more excess hydro through our hydro plants now than Crater Lake would produce because we just don't have it. So once you can store a lot of energy. Now you can start having things like solar and wind where you use those resources when they're available and then you use something like Crater Lake when it's not. So it doesn't pencil out like how much energy it you're getting? It doesn't pencil out as well because if you only have a six foot high dam, you might, you, you would only be able to store say um, 100 million gallons of active storage. That means you're going to fill it and spill it constantly unless you use it when it's available. So you're kind of forced to use it. And you may be forced to use it when we already have water available or power available. So then it ends up going to waste. So you end up creating a situation where you're building a, basically a storage project, but you're putting yourself in a position where you can only store a fourth or a fifth of the resource. So the bigger the dam, the better the storage. From a safety perspective, you're a six foot high, it's about one pound of pressure for every two feet of elevation. So you're changing the pressure from a six foot dam to three pounds per square inch to the pressure on a 30 foot dam of 15 pounds per square inch. And you know, as, as far as mechanical pressures go, that's it's an insignificant difference. It's not like the hundreds of pounds of pressure that many of the hydro projects around the state have. So. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, I know you're wrapping this up and it's a work session, but I just wanted to make one quick statement to a couple of those questions if possible. Um, That's good to me. Do you want to use the microphone? Or sure. On the phone? So the risk assessment that you talk about, um, it doesn't matter what risk assessment is done. Our lodge is built on an alluvial plain. If the dam fails, the water is going to go one direction to one place. We've seen the damage that a six foot ice dam does in that same Crater Lake exit. It almost wiped out our house and it took out the lodge. That's a six foot dam. Now the dam we're talking about, I thought was 25 feet, but Clay tonight, well that bumped up to 30. So I'm kind of confused because I hear different levels of how tall the dam's actually gonna be. Um, the geotech survey sounds pretty invasive. Our season at that lodge runs from May to October. We have 20 year history of word of mouth advertising. If you're gonna put a skitter road and a base camp 
and drill rigs up on the side of that mountain, when is that gonna happen where it's not gonna affect my business? My business is to take people from other places and give them a pristine Alaska adventure. Where's the base camp gonna be? When is the skitter road being put up behind my house? This isn't a very simple question. And the conversation has a lot of different outlets. I appreciate some of the, the council members that have come out to the property and actually looked at where the water's gonna go if it breaks. But there are no assurances that you can give me that a dam on a fault line is, does not have the potential to fail in a natural disaster. At any given time, I have hundreds of people in that lodge. I'm sorry, but it's a no-brainer. There's life and property at risk for this project. That's all I have to say. Thank you. And but do we have to, to adjourn? Do we just say we adjourn? Oh. It's 7 03. Yeah, you can do that. So that will adjourn the work session. <laughs> May 16, 2018, to order at 7.06. Uh, roll call, uh, let, let you uh, join me in the uh, Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. 
Roll call, please. Mayor Copeland. Here. James Burton. Here. Ken Jones. Here. Jeff Gard. Here. <clears throat> Alina Meyer. Here. Ann Schaefer. Here. David Allison. Here. James Weiss. Here. And Olivia Carroll. Here. That's a quorum. That's everybody. Uh, approval of the regular agenda. All those in favor? Did, did somebody move it? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All those in favor? Did James second it? Aye. Aye. I'll second it. Aye. Aye. Okay. <laughs> Fine. Opposed? Okay. Sorry, I meant to say also that there's no executive session needed. The attorney doesn't have any update for us. Okay. Mm. Uh, disclosures of conflicts of interest. Does council have any conflicts to declare? Okay, uh, even though I'm not a voting member, I'm going to declare a, a conflict on the uh, Crater Lake discussion and I'll recuse myself from that as well. And uh, also, I would like to recuse myself during um, communications, buy in petitions from visitors so I can speak on CEC's behalf to that agenda item. Uh, communications from visitors. We don't have any guest speakers yeah. for tonight. Oh, uh, yeah. So, audience comments regarding an agenda item. Yeah. Yeah. If you could just uh, go ahead to the mic, uh, Robin. Uh, your name and residence for the record. Uh, Rob Brown, South Point Machine, Cordova, Alaska. And uh, yeah, I'd just like to take a minute to um, thank uh, the council, the planning commission, city staff, and the public for the support on my project in the Northville so far. And um, and uh, I, th I think it's a good project. I've crunched a lot of numbers and uh, I think my return on investment is gonna be between three and 10 years. And um, it's gonna, you know, I'm gonna contribute to city coffers. And I think uh, you know, one of the most important things I think is, I don't know, they want to talk about economic development in town. And um, I think one of the biggest opportunities for development economically in this town. This what I've seen since its inception is the is the travel lift in the shipyard. And I think having my services is gonna make that much more desirable for people to bring their vessels here. I think I've said this before, but just to reiterate, you know, it's because um I mean right now we're just serving mostly vessels that work and are 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 home ported in Cordova and you know if um Make our track to get some vessels from out of town and really get that thing hopping because there's a lot of work going through there and a lot of revenue being generated. And I think that's just a good focus point of this. And, and um, I think that's about it. Yeah, and thank you. So, okay, thank you. Are there are audience comments regarding agenda items. Uh, Tom Miller, 304 Upper Inlet Drive. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Council the uh, work session that you had. You asked all the right questions. I got kind of informed. I came in with a lot of questions. I still got some. I really appreciate it. Uh, you guys seem to educate on what to ask. Uh, appreciate that. There's still some things I'm thinking about. I hope you guys will take the time, maybe in a couple more days, another meeting, <clears throat> think about what was discussed here tonight before you make the decision. I'd also like to re recommend that perhaps you get maybe an outside source consultant or something, somebody not associated with CEC or the building project and kind of go over the electrical part, the dam part, the hydro part with you on this, see if that makes sense. Uh, because your decision here, <coughs> you made this decision tonight, you're also in a sense giving Cordova Electric a green light, like we're partners, we're moving forward. You're starting us down that road to commit to $20 million plus project. And, and keep in mind, these prices are a year old. The estimates, prices have gone up. They've really gone up lately. Uh, steel's up 20, 30%. I was just in a box store the other day. Plywood that I used to buy for $11 a sheet is now $24 a sheet. So that's just in a short time. So those numbers that you've got, you can expect to be further for the project. But I appreciate you asking all the right questions. Put a lot of thought into this because you know, electric rates will go up, water rates will go up, mill rate will go up. Is it all worth it in the end? It might be, 
but I hope you'll really get yourself educated on it before you make the final decision. Thank you. I'd like to speak on that point too. Right no. Yes, this is Rob Brown. And yeah, I'd like to just uh, voice my support for to pursue these kind of projects. Um, it's just, I mean, when I look at it, it's a big battery up there that's filled by Mother Nature, and why not tap the thing, you know? But, but as far as the cost and the safety, I'm, I'm not really familiar with that, but um, I'm sure that's gonna be scrutinized greatly. But yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm for it. I mean, I guess uh, I'm made aware that that, uh, that Kodiak is 100% um, renewable energy, and, uh, and that'd be kind of a good goal for Cordova in the long term, you know, I think. Thank you. If um, I might recuse myself now to make some comments on Crater Lake, then if anyone else wants to speak, but I'm not sitting here influencing that process, so I'll pass the gavel to Ann for a minute. Clay Copeland, uh, 100 Jensen Drive, uh, Cordova. And uh, speaking on behalf of Cordova Electric, so the Crater Lake project, um, the timing of this request is not something that um, CEC had anticipated. In fact, we don't have this in our own operating budget. We decided that other work we were doing and uh, you know, a physical battery that we're looking at uh, freeing up more hydro from Power Creek. But uh, the opportunity knocked. We had an opportunity to get $100,000 of um, support from the Department of Energy. And we have a drilling crew coming in this summer that's gonna be drilling out, in fact, physically right in that area. And their equipment is suitable and we don't have to share in their MOB and DMOB cost, which is a big part of that. So the CEC board of directors voted to move forward with this. It's not a commitment to the project, it's the, it's the kind of the final answer and the necessary design information that helps you find uh, what are the risks with the geotechnical, which is the biggest remaining risk is the quality of the rock. And um, what are you gonna have to do to support that rock? In other words, that's gonna have a lot of influence on what your project cost is gonna be, because you're gonna know how much steel, how much concrete, how deep are you gonna have to put your anchors and foundations. So that helps you get a much more accurate overall project estimate. So that's why uh, now, and it's why we haven't done, frankly, more outreach with the rainies and the stakeholders and the permitting. We're, we're kind of scrambling now with the city to get that done to try to keep the cost down and, and share the costs. The CEC board, um, they really want a, a signal, at least from the city, and some contribution so that they're not bearing the full risk and cost of this. If we don't move forward, uh, then it's, you know, that's an opportunity we looked at and decided to go elsewhere, but. Um, so one city, uh, one Cordova Electric uh, board member did vote against moving forward with it just because they had not seen a commitment from the city. So they're hoping for one and hoping for a cost share so we can answer these questions and move forward. Um, and as far as the risk, I think I'll just leave that alone. It's, uh, um, I'm not a uh, risk expert. I know we have 68,000 dams in service in the US. They're very reliable. Just like you can find many instances of plane crashes or other bad things, you can find dam failures, but um, there's reasons and you can also um, mitigate those risks through design. So. Uh, the quality of the rock, though, is exceptional. It's, it's been created by glaciers, so and it's solid rock all the way around the whole intake. So usually failures are a result of geological weaknesses. That's why we're why we want to move forward with this drilling. So, thank you. I think I'll just sit out here until public comments are done. So I know y'all were expecting me to come back up here. So um, with that being said, um, yeah, for the amount of dams that are above populated areas that haven't failed, I can give you numbers that have. Um, the $100,000 from the city is a problem that I have as a 
commission member on in other areas. We've taken hard cuts in parks and recreation. The schools have taken hard cuts. I don't understand where $100,000 all of a sudden is magically here for a study on a project that may or may not happen when there are other areas in the city that need money and it's not there for them. The risk, there are no risk, there are no guarantees that you can give us that we and our clients and our property are going to be safe. Commissioner Guard or Council Member Guard said, said it pretty, pretty eloquently. There is one property at risk here, our property. We have a 20 year history being economically feasible. We have year round paid into this city and the economy of the city. We have a historic property and we've done it without being a big corporation. We've done it as a family business and we've done it successfully. And it's difficult for me to pay into a co-op that wants to use the money for something that's dangerous. It's difficult for me to come to the city and want to participate in the city that's willing to fund something that's dangerous. I 100% would love to see us have alternative energy, but not at risk to any single life or property. It's not worth it. It's just not worth it. And I know I'm the only one sitting in that chair right now, but I'm thinking of my family, my property, and my clients. Thank you. Are there any other audience comments? Okay, we will move on. Are there any chairpersons or representatives of boards and commissions here? A school board? Good evening, Alice Russin, superintendent. I live at 209 South 2nd Street here in Cordova. Just a couple of items. Um, graduation is happening this Saturday night at 5.30, so um, hope to see all of you in attendance in, in the crowd uh, cheering our graduates on. Um, strategic planning, we're still in the process of our strategic planning uh, as a district and our sort of the next stage or phase of, of developing that plan um, includes identifying core values and some of the um, principles around education that we want to examine as a school district. And so look for invites to the community here in the upcoming couple of weeks to participate in some community forums and um, weigh in. I know we're competing with uh, fishing season that, that gets underway here soon, but um, you know, look for additional opportunities as the summer and, and fall um, presents themselves. Um, we're also in the process of uh, budget planning. At our last May uh, board meeting, we had a first read of our budget and we're looking to um, approve that budget at the June meeting, uh, June the 12th and um, hope to see anybody there. We are looking at some um, drawdown on our fund balance to kind of move forward with some of our needs that have been identifi identified over the past couple of years. We've done a fair number of needs assessments, um, taking a look at what the interests and needs of our students were, are, and um, you know some facility needs as well. So um, we're looking at drawing down that fund balance of about $450,000. Um, for next year, and that will leave us with about a three hundred thousand um, dollar fund balance or so for, ne for next year. Um, and if you had any questions um, specific to that and wanted to visit my office at any time, you're more than welcome to drop in and, and ask any questions that you might have. Um, and then the last piece, you've kind of heard this song and dance before, but um, I've been talking with Alan the past couple of days um, on some facility needs. And uh, there's a, a new bubble that has appeared in the floor, uh, high school gym floor. And, um, and so, you know, we're hosting three major events next year in addition to our usual district events, um, three regional events, and really want to take an opportunity to try to get that addressed. Um, recent conversations with the flooring company out of um, Wasilla, um, they had some, um, some opportunities to do that work this summer. Um, the end of August, the first part of September, if we are able to kind of move quickly with the, with the decision around addressing the floor needs. Um, the district does have available uh, 
about $135,000 towards a, a $250,000 um, floor replacement. So um, I'll be officially coming to you, I think at the next council meeting, perhaps in June, um, to make that um, official request for consideration to help us uh, fulfill you know, the rest of the funds that we need for that, um, that project. I've got plenty of data um, if you're so interested to see how the community uses the facility um, in addition to um, our students and staff as well. So if anybody has an interest in, in taking a look at that, um, it's not just the school who uses the facility. We've got a great um, community um, activities and, and leagues and different things that use our facility. So um, we're looking at that. Appreciate Alan kind of fitting me in in the past couple of days in his busy schedule to have a conversation and kind of update him on some things. With that, thank you. Ryan, thank you. Questions? Questions? Green McGinley says hi from uh, Cuts View. Uh, CCMC? Okay, the student council representative. Libya. Uh, as the school year closes, the Cordova School District would like to thank the city and community for its contributions to the lives of our students. This year we accomplished much and have come so far as a district. We are sending off 22 seniors on Saturday at 5.30, each to go down their own path and do great things with their lives. The juniors coming up are pretty awesome, if I do say so myself. Uh, just last night at the Academic Awards, we recognized individuals who always put their best foot forward and strive to succeed. Not only paying attention to the intelligence of our students, but their character as well, which is very important to CHS. CHS is proud of their students, for they have much to be proud of. As we end the school year and break off for the summer, we would like to send our deepest gratitude to the city and the people of Cordova. Our school would not be able to do what we do without you. Education is, highly, is a highly important asset in every person's life, and we are so blessed to have a city council, staff, and community that sees just how necessary it is. Thank you, Cordova. We appreciate all you have done. Also, come and see the play put on by the CHS drama class tomorrow. It's called All I Really Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. It begins at 7, and admission is by donation only. Okay, thank you. Approval of the consent calendar. We have four items on there. Is there any the council would like to reserve? Okay, hearing none, roll call vote. I got there, sorry. On the consent calendar, Melina Meyer? Yes. Ken Jones? Yes. Ann Schaefer? Yes. James Weiss? Yes. David Allison? Yes. Jeff Gard? Yes. James Burton? Yes. Consent calendar. Okay, approval of minutes of April 18th and May 2nd. I move to approve the minutes of April 18th and the minutes of the May 2nd regular meetings. Second. Have a motion, a second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, the minutes are approved as submitted. Uh, we're picking up a little bit of uh, paper shuffling or something online if you have a chance to mute. Uh, there's no bids for tonight. Um, mayor's report, uh, I don't have anything to add at this time, except a Waters Award. It's a real award. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to invite Sam and Leif to come up here for a moment, please, representing our water team for this project. in the state this year, uh, Anchorage and Cordova, and then this EPA region, there's only 10 awarded to the Northwest states. So I, I think it's really a reflection. This, this has been a, a, a long process. Uh, it's been a 10-year project, uh, totaling about $7 million. And uh, I think 
I think this award speaks to the uh, efforts and the professionalism of our water department, um, Melvin Fajardo, uh, Joel Felix, um, Tom Hutchins, John Hutchins, um, Daniel Anaharm, and uh, Joseph Sison. And uh, also, uh, for, for a big, huge grant project like this to be successful, especially working with a federal agency, it takes a tremendous amount of administrative work to administer all those grants and to satisfy the agency requirements and, frankly, to get your reimbursement and get the cost shares for it. So um, uh, Sam and, and uh, Leif have really uh, provided the continuity and a lot of the heavy lifting for this project throughout. And uh, on behalf of the city, we just want to thank you for your work and, and getting this project completed. And this award is from the Environmental Protection Agency for using a loan to finance a project that's well-planned, affordable, transferable, efficient, resilient, and sustainable to the City of Cordova for LT2 compliance upgrades and for showing exceptional creativity and dedication to public health protection. Questions of me on the mayor's report? Okay, uh, manager's report. I'd certainly like to say thanks to, uh, you know, Public Works and Water, and particularly Sam and Lake. They, they've, uh, since I've arrived, I've asked them to do a lot of things. And uh, perhaps not in their job description and sometimes not in their comfort zone, but they've jumped right in and it's really been a pleasure to to work with them and they're really diligent about uh, these grants and completing those grants. Um, I, I have several things that I think are uh, updates from previous meetings that will be informative. Uh, the comprehensive plan is out to bid and uh, that is due on June 14th. So we're, we're uh, collecting those you know, submittals and we will go through them to see who meets our needs. One of the things that we've talked about doing during this process that we don't know is possible, but I've had some conversations with various people is, um, as you know, we talked about the, big, the build grant, which is the old Tiger grant. Uh, the native village is filling out one of those for the EAC Corporation to be submitted. The timeline was very short, July 19th this year. And we, had, we wanted to, to gear up for one next year and that would require someone who would write that grant for us. We have, um, <laughs> we have possibilities. So we, 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 if we can, we'd like to, we'd like to marry that with a comp plan process and see if we can get both of those done at the same time and have any economy of scale on that. So uh, we, we haven't reached that conclusion yet, but we'll have that conversation with potential bidders on that project. Um, the RV park expansion, uh, we found an old map from 2000 or 2001 and uh, I was looking at it today with uh, Susie, and so we're gonna, you know, Sam did a, a great analysis of the cost and the return on investment for both Five Mile, which by the way, it looks like it's off the table. We had no interest in Five Mile, so we're concentrating on the ODX site. And uh, we, we should have something coming back to you in that respect. Uh, the used oil building is out for a second bid, for a second proposal process, and it is due on July 12th. We, we did a really long proposal time on that. Um, we, we pared down some of the, some of the uh, parts of that bid, hoping to <coughs> get that in a place where it might fit our money. As you know, Weston Bennett resigned 
and his last day is the 25th. And we have uh, rewritten that job description a little bit, and that is out, out on the market right now, and it will be out on the market, well, until the position is filled. So, but the initial uh, update on that is June 18th. Um, I do, I did get back uh, a pretty, during strategic planning, uh, Councilman Jones talked about um, summer chairlift operations, and I have some information that came back from the, uh, the association, and uh, you know, quite honestly, um, this doesn't really pencil out very well. Uh, ADA, safety, there's a variety of things that go in this. Um, you know, personnel to run the chair up during the summer. Uh, this, this would be a relatively expensive, but what I'll do is I'll, I'll, um, I'll get this to you either in a new session or send it to you by email or, or something so that you can look at it. Um, and then um, kind of a final follow-up thing is we had, a, uh, as most of you saw this morning and some last night, there was a, there was a, a news report on KTVA out of Anchorage uh, with uh, uh, Scott Mitchell at the hospital uh, allegedly indicating that our hospital would close in June. And I'd just like to emphatically say that is not accurate. Um, we have, um, with uh, Kathy's great assistance, we have a press release that's out. We put it on our website. We're, we're keeping up to date on it. We'll have an update tomorrow if there is one, but uh, the hospital is not gonna close. This is, a, this is a federal regulatory agency funding issue. We paid our share, we paid our portion, and the, the onus is kinda on them. Uh, Murkowski is aware, Senator Murkowski is aware of it. Our other congressional delegates are aware of it. So this is moving along. We've known about this for a long time. It's been ongoing, and we've been dealing with this for a long time. It's unfortunate that it was portrayed in the media the way it was portrayed, but there's our hospital is not going to close. So I just wanted to make that clear, and I, I've given some of you a hard copy and then sent you the press release otherwise. So uh, with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Any questions, Council, or online? Oh, can I, can I add one yeah. thing? I, you know, uh, tr I've, I've really not um, expressed an opinion on the Crater Lake project, and I'm, I'm not going to do that. Uh, wh what I would say was, if you look at this, I think it's a, uh, what we're trying to do in any project that we address is to do it strategically. And I think one of the issues that we've talked about over and over and over is we, we would like some growth. And so um, I always keep that in mind when I look at things and while short-term costs, long-term costs, and I think what, what we've tried to, to portray is that in this process, there's two things that are very critical, I think, of this magnitude. One is having jumping off points. The first jumping off point was after the feasibility study. The second jumping off point is after the geotechnical study, because if we find out that there's anything wrong with the geology of the project, then you don't have to go forward. Have you spent some money, taken some risk? Yes, but you, are you committed to the end? No. So keeping jumping off points for us. The second thing that I think I, I've talked about and portrayed is, uh, in my still relative newness, is that I would offer that projects of this magnitude, magnitude, not just this project, if you look at the harbor, if you look at a large Northfield project, if you look at anything, these are all good candidates for, uh, I used the term once, the Hail Mary 
uh, funding level, but really, it, it, it's really dependent, I think, in a community of this size on strong state and or federal funding, and keep that in mind as we go forward, because, you know, certainly, if, if we had to, to go half of this alone at 10 million, that would really give you something to think about, because you, you feel it tonight, I know you feel it. You're under tremendous financial pressure. You're under tremendous financial pressure from the stuff that, that we need to do internally. Got my list today, I'm updating the list. We have tens of millions of dollars that we need to address just in our operation. Five enterprise funds, talking about numbers for water pipes, those kinds of things. So you're under tremendous financial pressure to fully fund our portion of the school funding. You're under tremendous financial pressure to make sure that the hospital keeps operating. There's a lot of financial pressure here. But with careful and strategic thought, we can make our way through all of this. Just, we just have to be, to plan ahead and be wary of all of those things. By the way, one more thing, one more quick thing. Speaking about money, you know, one of the reasons we talk about cash flow, and you, this is counterintuitive to what we're asking tonight, money for the gym floor, money for a geotechnical study, money for a comp plan, counterintuitive. But the reason we keep a large amount of cash on hand, first of all, we have a million dollars sitting with your investment firm, kind of as a last resort. But as of, t as of the end of March, our expenditures year to date are four million of a $10,400,000 budget, but our income is only 1.9 million. So we've got a $2.1 million gap in cash flow. Eventually it catches up with itself. That's why we have a lot of cash on hand. We keep a lot of cash or cash level. We're tracking really well on the expenditures. Um, um, income is a little bit behind as expected in the first year. We don't get our two big sales tax. We'll get our first big sales tax until four months into the, or the sixth month of the year, second quarter. So <clears throat> um, all in all, it looks good. Uh, questions, Council? Yeah, I actually had one question about the recent election for Prop 1 and 2, because those were in our budget, um, and we've been collecting those taxes up until this point. When do those taxes go away, or do can you figure out how much we've collected on those taxes so we know how much we're missing right now? We started working on that this morning. Um, I, don't, I don't know what the, the answer is to what the number is. And I think it, they, they end when the election is certified, which will be? Uh, the 24th, May 24th, noon, we're having a special meeting to certify. I imagine we're allowed to call it the next day that we would stop an end to those, yeah. So I think, it, you know, rough, rough estimates, 50% or less what we're looking at, probably even less than that based upon the season. So uh, we'll have to, we'll have to get through it. I have some suggestions for you. Any other questions, council? Okay, uh, clerk's report. I was gonna say, um, after Alan's last point about timing of the time of year and income and stuff, uh, revenue. Um, I'm trying to help with one of those, so we'll certify the roll tonight um, and then set the mill rate next time. Uh, of course, we don't collect property tax until the last of August and the last of October, so that's a big chunk of money that comes late also. Um, but besides working on certifying the roll, of course we were handling an election yesterday, and um, the election board did a great job. As usual, five ladies were here, and Tina and I, for about 17 or 18 hours yesterday. Um, 
and we got everything tallied and you know the counting went a little more quickly than I thought so that was good um, there are about there could be as many as 150 ballots left to count it depends on how the nine question ballots come back to me from division of elections as to whether or not those will count or how many of those will count uh, there's only about four more absentee by mail yet to be returned to me, but those might still make it timely. They would need to be here by um, Tuesday the 22nd. And then at 9 a.m. on the 23rd, Wednesday, we'll count those last few. Uh, well, it's more than a few. Uh, as far as how the votes went, I mean, I think Prop 2 and Prop 3, motor fuel and marijuana, are within 150, so there's a slight possibility of those being turned. But over the years, usually the absentee vote goes about the percentages of the regular vote. So I don't anticipate either of those being overturned, but I guess we won't really know <coughs> until after we count. Um, I guess that's about all I have. I can answer property questions when that item comes up, if there are any. And I can answer other questions now. Any other questions, Council? Okay, uh, correspondence about emails from Carolyn Lynn Potter and uh, Rob Brown. And under ordinances and resolutions, uh, ordinance 1169, an ordinance of the city council of the city of Cordova, Alaska, authorizing the city manager to enter into a 10 year lease agreement with Saddle Point Machine LLC, which includes an option to purchase described as lot three, block five, Northfield Development Park, uh, first reading. I move to approve ordinance 1169. Do I need to say anything else? No, that's fine. Second. Have a motion and a second. This is the first reading, so it's just a boys' vote, but uh, Councilman Meyer would like to speak to your motion. Yeah, I looked over it. It looked like the lease agreement might have been different than how we've done it in the past, and it seemed like a good, good thing for the economy and for the travel lift and for the fishing industry, so. Councilman Lees? Um, yeah. Sorry about that. I, uh, yeah. uh, further discussion, Council? Okay, hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Um, I'm going to recuse myself for this next item and just pass the gavel to. Councilman Schaefer. And this is actually, it's a resolution that uh, allocates unbudgeted funds. So it's actually gonna be a roll call vote and it requires a majority of council. Does need a motion? Well, yeah. Um, what Clay's been doing is okay. reading it, so then the person making the motion doesn't have to. So if you don't mind reading it into the record, that'll work. Okay, so before us is resolution 05 18 12. It's a resolution of the City Council of the City of Cordova, Alaska, authorizing amendment of the FY18 budget and authorizing the expenditure to be used for geotechnical assessment for the Crater Lake project. Council? I move that we uh, adopt resolution 0518-18-12 for purposes of discussion. Second. So we have a motion and a second. Councilman Gunn. Do we need to select an option there? Well, I... A funding level option? 
I think there's a bunch of stuff. Yeah, I think there's a lot of discussion. Well, I, I, I think you could, I put options in there for you to pick, but you can pick, you can pick zero funding level to a, to a hundred, hundred percent of the request, which is a hundred thousand. You can sort of name what it is that you want to do. I'm just trying to make it open so you weren't locked into any particular position. Um, I think, uh, you know, when we talk about uh, the funding, uh, the discussion that uh, this money really could come from the from the water fund uh, because it is a water project. Uh, depending upon, I'm trying to find it right now what their what their uh, what their reserve account is. Uh, but I, I, I did say in this resolution that it's coming from the, you know, come from the general fund because um, we obviously have lots of expenses in both. So this will be transferred. Let me see if I can find it real quick here. Mm -hmm. But you can. Right, Councilman Gard, you made the motion. So would you like to a quick question for Clay on this. What are we talking about for total dollars for doing the geotechnic plan? Now you said we had the hundred thousand dollars fed money. We're anticipating about five hundred thousand dollars. So mm -hmm. five hundred to six hundred thousand. You guys speak into the mic, please. Uh, he was saying uh, they're anticipating about five to six hundred thousand dollars worth of costs, total cost for the geotechnical sort of study. So you may, uh, Councilman Lee, you made the second. Do you have anything you'd like to say? Um, no, I kind of just seconded for discussion. I, I uh, <coughs> feel like this is something I'd really like to see happen. I don't see it happening right now. We just we just had a review on on two different tax ordinances and uh, more funding request from the city. I I feel like if we didn't do this, I might eat my words a lot because I've got a brother that just bought a cannery. And just in case, you know, and, and we are expanding our, our need for water in Camp 2's building. Hopefully this is this is happening. Um, I, uh, it, I, I haven't seen a lot of public opinion and support of it. And um, I uh, uh, wouldn't mind if, uh, if water has a reserve and that's something a water department was amenable to or reverting this back to staff like Mr. Baylor recommended and really getting a, just giving us some more time. I, I don't know what, what CEC's time crunch is, but, but I, you know, I, I would like to go about this strategically if, if we can. I mean, I, uh, In the budget year two, your balance is for the sewer fund and the water fund are 387, 387,000 in the sewer fund and 372,000 in the water fund. I, uh, you know, in the, in the progress through this, um, certainly we could, figure out a cost for you, what it would take to hire that kind of expertise that, um, you know, third party come into a risk assessment for us. I, I don't know the, the engineering part of doing a risk assessment without a geotechnical study. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that'd be something that we'd have to 
look at the costs and get back to you on that, what that would be if that's the direction you wanna go. Um, you know, have a, a third party assessment of the feasibility of the project and those kinds of things. And I wasn't trying to step on any toes or anything. It came up in public comments, so I wanted to repeat it. Madam Chair, this is Councilmember Allison. Go ahead, Councilmember Allison. Are we discussing an option? Did I miss somebody? Are we? Are we talking 100,000 or are we talking 25 or? I don't think a number has been mentioned yet. So we're discussing any funding level. Okay, I, I, I guess my, my comments on it, uh, just, you know, maybe random here a little bit, but uh, I don't believe that the city as an entity really needs this project for water. I think some of those questions were, were asked earlier. And, and I don't think that, I guess, having worked in the seafood industry for 30 years, there's a lot you can do to, uh, to conserve the water. And if they were paying what it actually costs for the water, that they would try to make more efforts towards those lines. So, so I don't think from the city, perspective as an entity that we really need the water. Uh, the city as a community, however, I think this project could be beneficial uh, as a whole, uh, not only for water reserves, but for on the electric side of things. I don't think we can tell without, we can tell what the risk really is without doing something along the geotechnical side. Uh, I don't. I don't necessarily think that we should be all in at a hundred thousand dollars, but I think that we need to show that we are uh, at least a partner in figuring out what the safety levels are. And in fact, I would venture to propose that potentially um, this project could make it actually safer than it is currently. Now that's just a, you know wild hair assumption or presumption um, that some scientists would get big money to, to study. Um, but uh, <clears throat> but I do believe that uh, without the geotechnical, you really can't, can't go any further. I think CEC is already committed to doing this project. It makes sense to save dollars $200,000 on the demo cost by having the company do it that's already here doing the same work. For another entity, so so I'm in favor of of uh, supporting the geotechnical and, and supporting CEC in their endeavors, uh, not necessarily just for water. You know, I just assumed they did it and bill us for any water over 1.5 million that we took, but that's a whole other <coughs> negotiation. Um, but I'm more thinking the 25 or 50 thousand dollar level. But since we don't have a number out there, I won't suggest an amendment at this time. But anyway, those are my thoughts. I have the similar opinion as Councilman Allison and that I think it would be good to have more of the information that would come from the geotechnical assessment. Like that'd be valuable information and whatever the results that come from that, you know, then from that point we can decide whether to go ahead or whether to step back. But given the current budget um, state for the city and like the you know, taxes are just repealed and funding requests from the school might be coming and I think $100,000 is a big ask. I, I mean, I wouldn't be comfortable supporting that amount either. But I do, I think the information that would come from this would be valuable. Um, and from there, we can reassess um, moving forward. But yeah, just with the, how our budget is right now, I think that is, that's, it's too much. I'll go next. Yep, go ahead. 
Okay, so first and foremost, the biggest stumbling block that I see here is uh, the fact that we don't have the downstream property owners on board with this. The range has spoke several times about this um, in one way, shape, or form. And until there's some collaboration there uh, where either those fears are, are set aside or concerns are addressed, I don't support using any city money um, to move forward on this project. That being said, I also did a little small poll, uh, and the response was overwhelmingly negative, and this does not lack, or this does not have the support of our public um, to move forward on, especially, you know, considering we're stewards of the city's money, and uh, we don't want to govern by referendum, as we've been uh, exposed to several times now. So without more public support, I can't support using city funding for this at this point in time. Yeah, council member Schaefer. Yep, who is that? Go ahead. Okay, yeah. I Who is this? Have the same mind yeah. as, oh. Uh, and, um, you know, I just, I, I'm opposed to this project, spending any money on this project this time. We have a harbor that's falling apart, roads that can't fix, schools that need work. We have 500 buildings on Main Street that we can't fill with businesses. And a hospital that needs a million dollars per every year, plus another million dollar bill for communication. I don't believe we need this project. I believe it has the potential to raise our water rate. And uh, yeah. I don't really see any potential for it lowering our electricity rate. We've already had two hydro projects, and electricity is more expensive now than it was 30 years ago. Uh, I don't want to see us spending $100,000 that we don't have on something we don't need. And uh, I also agree that there is a potential for loss of life, and that is uh, the fatal flaw of this project. Thank you. I guess I'm the last one, so I'll go. Um, I definitely can't support $100,000 from the city going in there. Um, if I were to vote on it, it'd be probably on the lower end, just kind of on the same side that a lot of you guys were saying it'd be nice to have the have this information so we can see what the rock is and um, but I do really see the concerns of Orca Lodge I mean if I had a dam built above my house and had a lot of people in and out of there I'd be very concerned too um, but we need power, we need some green energy, and hydro seems like a good idea, and it's nice fresh water. I just don't know if we need the water um, at this time. In the future, we could. Um, I don't know. I have a hard time really picking a side on what way to go, and um, I don't know. I've given it a lot of thought. I think a lot of you guys have given a lot of thought, too, but um, yeah, I don't really know where I'm at. <laughs> Madam Chair, I'd like to make an amendment. Go ahead. This is Councilmember Allison. I'd like to plug in a $25,000 and change the whereas to say that the funding comes from the Water Fund General Reserve, whatever that Water Reserve Fund is that we um, put their depreciation account in. Um, there's an amendment. Is there a second? Do we need to second? Yes. Is there a second? to support that amendment? I'll second. Um, Councilman Allison, would you like to talk about the amendment? Yeah, I just think that until we get something on the table, what's really the motion, what didn't have the details on the table so that we can either vote it up or down. I, Again, I'll support the 25,000 coming from the water, um, water reserve fund. Um, I don't think I would go much more than that, but I think it's important to get the geotechnical done and then we can go from there with the, we, we can't really know the risk until we, we see that information. So I think it's worth 25,000 to get that and uh, I'll support it. Okay, thank you. Councilman Gard. Um, I know this is 
an emotional, fearful thing for those that live downstream from it. Um, and I don't think we can make a good, well-informed decision as a community without having more information than we have right now. Um, I don't think any of us want to do anything that's gonna put anybody at risk downstream from it. Um, it's not committing us to building anything. It's just giving us some more information. Um, this grant money that we're talking about for the geotechnical study, this isn't like highway money or something to where if we don't build the highway, we have to pay it back. It's there to use for it. Uh, Okay, that's my two cents. Are there any other council comments? I guess I have one comment. Go ahead. Uh, council member Jones. I, uh, Joe, after listening to a couple other council members' comments, um, sounds like people are leaning towards wanting more information regarding, you know, the, the risk, and we won't know the risk until we have more information. Well, I just want to, you know, I guess, point out to people that that area is prone to landslide. That area was made by a landslide. Uh, if you drive out Orca Lodge or Orca Canary Road, uh, there's multiple different slide plans and, and issues where we've had to clear rocks off in the past. And just doing this geotechnical work with having a skid steer going up on that hillside should have the potential of destabilizing the region. And, uh, and destabilizing our water source. And that's just not a risk that I am willing to take. Is that a risk? Can I ask a question? Is that a risk, like the, the land stability and whatnot? Is that, I don't know. Because <laughs> we can say that's a thing, but is it actually, I don't know, I just. I, is, the, is that a legitimate risk we're having equipment and Stuff going up and down that mountainside, will it destabilize? I don't know. I, we, Anything I mean, we can have a road. Listen to risk mm -hmm. out there, the risk of polluting a water source and how they needed assurance in place before they were willing to permit the activity. That was like an hour ago. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilman Garn. Um, one more question for Clay. What, um, Can you use your microphone, please? What kind of discussions uh, CEC had with um, the Oracle Lodge owners, the Rainies, um, on how to do this without drastically impacting their business season this year? Would you like to come up and use a microphone, Clay? Yeah. I just want to say, I think as much as I'd like to, I think I'd rather just not participate. I mean, there's, um, yeah, I think it's better if I just stay out of the discussion, honestly. I tried to give what comments I could, you know, beforehand. No, I am. I'm not trying to be confrontational. Yeah. I'm just trying to figure out because they, those were some of the, some of the fears that were stated from the property owner stuff. And I just don't know what all's gone on. That's all I was asking for was a little bit of background. Um, I, I think like with any project, there's going to be a lot of ongoing discussions uh, at every step of the process, and I think I'm comfortable saying that. Okay. Uh. At the city manager, Lanning, do you have a comment? Well, um, I've been involved in about 30 plus public projects of various sizes. I've never had one that ever satisfied anyone, but I've always taken the same tact, and that is to beyond the safety risk factor that at some point in the project, 
would be determined for you with certainty, we're trying to keep our risk at the lowest possible level as an entity in a community. And I think that's just, you, you're taking little steps at a time to get yourself to a place of assurance that you can go forward or stop. Again, we're trying to give you jumping off points. This is a jumping off point. Do the geotech comes back that it's, there are uncertainties, you can jump off. The other portion is mitigating risk in the process of doing the geotechnical study. Can anybody say with 100% certainty that there's nothing bad is going to happen? Nope. You know, so this is a calculated uh, thing that has been done literally thousands and thousands of times across the country. There are people that are skilled at doing it, and it's our job as a community that if you approve it, that we make certain that the person doing it keeps our risk as low as possible. I think if you were going to take a step for 50000 to assure yourself of where you want to go, you have to ask yourself, is, is spending a certain amount of money, whether it's 25 or 50, whatever it is, worth the assurance of knowing that you're taking the next step in knowledge? And that, that's what you have to ask yourself. It, it, is there anybody that can offer you right now that this absolutely will work? or it absolutely won't work. I don't think there's anybody in this room that knows that answer right now. I know there are people that have passion about it and say that there are these risks involved for us, and that's true. But for moving forward with any project, you have to de determine your level of risk. Could we bring in an outside expert? We, we might spend $25,000 and they would say, what I need to make this assessment for you is I need a geotechnical study. I don't even know the answer to that at this point. So just my two cents. Are there any other comments from council? Councilman Garden. I'd like to make a further motion. I'd like to move that we table this until the next meeting to give everybody some time to take a breath and figure out what's going on. I'll second that motion. Councilman Guy. I think I said it all in the motion. Does anyone else have any comment about the motion? Councilman Meyer. Um, I think just some extra time to think about it and where we are financially, whether we want to spend the money or not, just like a few more weeks to think about it. I don't want to just keep pushing it off, but um, so I can make a decision that I feel good about. Any other comments on the motion? Okay. I'd rather it be refer to staff. Can we call it refer to staff? I have no problems with that. Just because I don't know all the rules on table and I'm afraid I'll get it wrong and then we'll have screwed that all up. But if you refer to staff and something crazy happens and it doesn't make it to the next meeting, it's okay. It can come at the next one. This way if it's referred to staff, it can just come back. And then it also kills the rest of those motions too. Okay. Okay. So do you want me to do a roll on refer, or do you want to just take the vote? Oh, and we, or you can still have a discussion on it if you want. Does anyone else want to discuss this motion? Anyone on the phone? Yeah, I guess I just have one comment. You know, this is brought up multiple times over the last couple of years. Um, I know that it's late at this time, but the essence with this summer's building uh, season on this, we have all seven council members present. Uh, this might not be the case in uh, future meetings. I would prefer to see this decision be made tonight. 
Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Okay, then, oh, sorry. I, I, I actually, I would second that. We're, we're talking about a maximum of $25,000 or not. The way I see it, um, I, I think that's fine as well. Okay. So we're gonna vote on whether or not to refer it to staff. And I'm gonna take a roll, okay? Okay. Okay, so on refer to staff. Melina Meyer. Yes. Ken Jones. No. Ann Schaefer. Yes. Jeff Gard. Yes. David Allison. Yes. James Weiss. No. James Burton. Yeah. Motion carries five to two. Mm. Hey, uh, thank you, Councilman Schaefer. Um, we don't have unfinished business on the agenda. Um, under new and miscellaneous business, uh, we have the certification of the 2017 property assessment roll. I move to certify the 2018 property assessment rule as presented by the city clerk's office. I second. I have a motion, a second. Did you want to speak to the motion, Councilman Allison? Uh, no, this is a pretty straightforward motion. You know, this, uh, it's all been calculated and it is what it is, so to certify it. Any additional um, discussion? Any discussion, Council? Hearing none, uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, the 2017 property roll is certified. Pending agenda calendar and elected and appointed officials list. Councilman Gard. <clears throat> I'd like to put uh, on the next agenda um, the uh, um, Discussion about uh, raising the sales tax a half a percent in town to cover missing revenues after yesterday's vote. We've been talking tonight about excess dollars going out for school gym floors and other projects. We were talking about money for geotechnical studies money for um, comprehensive plan and we just blew a $340,000 hole in, <coughs> in our fairly minimal budget as it was. Maybe, um, I just have a suggestion, maybe uh, just a discussion of revenues in general because I, I think I heard Councilman, or uh, Manager Lanning say that he was, staff was kind of working on a response to not having those tax revenues. So would that be all right? That could certainly be one of the options to just... Um, it might come up in the discussion. Uh, in favor of it, but you know, if we we're talking, you know, close to a half million dollars in unbudgeted funds, we're talking about. We've talked about here just tonight, plus the three hundred and forty thousand dollars going the other direction. Mm -hmm. So that's another three hundred, you know, three quarters to a miller better that we're <clears throat> looking at the permanent fund for basically. Okay. We can put it on the agenda that way, I guess, and it could always expand into other revenue options. So were you thinking next regular meeting or is it June, Susan, that we generally go to? June 6th. What's okay. the question? Oh, and one. then we generally, council kind of decides on a month by month basis whether we have one meeting a month. Yes, but I okay. think we have something planned for the second June meeting. Second in June, you have the Homeland Security people coming on the 20th. Not this is the 20, 20, <coughs> June 20. When do we set the property tax? No, right. On the 6th. Okay, yeah, so that would be the time for that discussion. And, um, okay. So, so okay, but sales tax increase is going to be an ordinance, right? Yeah, it would I think. be. On, on June 20th, you can, you, you can have a session afterwards or not. We just have the, the Homeland Security folks scheduled from 5 to 7. Okay. All right. Okay, so wait, so, I need more clear. Are we we're putting an ordinance on for the next meeting to increase sales tax by a half a percent? 
Is that your request? That was my request. Okay, to actually draft an ordinance for a half a percent sales tax increase. I guess I'd like to hear at least one other councilman that wants to do Because let's, let's try and follow our pending agenda thing so that if a council member makes a suggestion, mm -hmm. I know it's tough for you too because it puts you on the spot, but Alan can say yes or you can say yes. Or if not, I would agree that possibly a second council member's support would be required to put it on as an action item. I, I, I'm not going to put it on myself unless, I mean, there's seven councilmen here. I'll support it. I want to hear at least two councilmen saying you want to see that ordinance in front of you, and then it's a pretty good idea that council will consider it. I, I mean, I, I would prefer to be, have, have a discussion before we reactionary put another another tax onto the agenda for an action item. I mean, we have uh, first season come back, it's the fish tax from last year. Okay, well, we've got two councilmen requesting. Yeah, and we have two councilmen requesting. It's on the agenda. Okay. Yeah, I don't think it would hurt to have that discussion. No, the, yeah, we can always vote one way or the other, but the discussion, too, of like how you said you're working on the numbers and the analysis. So nice to see what yeah. you've been working on as well. Because just structurally, as Susan said, a sales tax change is an ordinance. So that goes through the readings, it has exposure to referendum. What's happened in the past is, um, <laughs> you know, the setting the property tax roll becomes the de facto thing because that's something council does by action and that's where the revenue shortfalls tend to land. So this whole strategic planning process over the last year and a half and identifying where to spread those, raise those revenues, mm -hmm. part of the strategy has been to not put it on the property tax, but that's what generally ends up happening. So, okay. Well, uh, other pending agenda items. Well, so June 6th, there will be a public hearing. I should have not put maybe because a rate setting resolution such as the mill rate requires a public hearing. So yeah. there will be a public hearing. Do we have a plan for a work session before that? Because, you know, that would be the, a good spot for a revenue discussion at the work session previous on the 6th. You need a rate setting for property tax? No, the, maybe just revenues in general before we get to the ordinance that's gonna be on the regular meeting. I don't know. Well, I, th I think we can use the work session on the, you know, at the next meeting on the 6th to speak to, you know, to the sales tax in particular, the merits and, and uh, drawbacks from that, as well as the other revenue sources. You know, we have, uh, if, if you look back, we have that, um, that examination of exemptions and exceptions. We, I think in one of those documents, we characterized where the real bang for the buck was in terms of raising revenue. There have been other suggestions in the community that there was a revenue committee, um, you know, back in, was it 13, 14? Mm -hmm. That ended up not making a recommendation to you. And again, I think, I think going forward in terms of revenue, the discussion is wide open. What I try to warn against in our initial discussions was the additional revenue part of it, sort of viewing the, the one year and the individual impact of that upon our budget. And I, I just hope, hope we, can, we can sort of diffuse that and really stay with our designated consistent revenue as part of the discussion. So uh, we we can we can talk about it all. I'll be we'll be prepared to speak to anything. Mayor Copeland, I meant to get with you before this meeting about pending agenda. Okay. We've been doing too much discussing at pending agenda, and I just fear yeah. the public is going to come to me sometime and say. You guys were talking about revenue and it wasn't anywhere on the agenda. Well, we can form this on the agenda later, but let's just plan on having a public hearing. Alan and I can get together, and uh, but then we'll have an agenda item for a, to con a, a 45 minute work ordinance. session previous yeah. to the. And then we'll have a um, ordinance to consider a half percent sales tax increase. Okay. Um, Anything Sorry, else? I don't mean to Anything stifle else? pending agenda, but I fear the council. Yeah, no, we do tend to get hung up there, so. Okay. Mayor Coleman? Yes, Councilman Allison. 
Yeah, I just want, I'm sure Alan's probably already got a plan, but I just want to be sure because time is of the essence that we get something on the agenda for the uh, school gym, because that, that is pretty time sensitive. They, they're going to get it done this summer. Yeah, that, that'll be on the next agenda for sure. Okay. All right, uh, audience, uh, sorry, yeah, we got the pending agenda and elected and appointed officials. Uh, audience participation. Oh, you know what, real quick, sorry. Mm -hmm. Just that um, I think I, I should have mentioned this in my report, but that we have a few vacancies. I was just going to mention that. So oh. if we have, that, well, actually, I was going to ask if any had come in, any no. others of interest. Okay. No. Um, and I, I guess I'll just mention that I'm going to have the um, meeting with uh, boards and commissions tomorrow at noon. No, next. Or, uh, next Thursday. Yeah. Okay. 24? That's right, the 24th. Yeah. Oh, shoot. We have a special meeting next Thursday. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, so spread the word. We have some vacancies. Maybe we'll have a special meeting. Next Thursday at noon. Well, we I know we will because we have to certify the to certify the, the uh, uh, election. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm sure your meeting, your lunch could start just after that. There's not much to certify in the election. Yeah, no, oh, that's I fine. I just need four of you present by phone or however. However. Okay. Okay. It's required that I do it within nine days of the election, so I don't really know what would happen if I didn't get four. But I will scrounge you guys up by phone or however. Okay. Okay. Uh, audience participation. Tom, we have three or four RK Islands, right? Thanks for your discussion. Um, I guess I need to clarify myself a little bit on what I was thinking about getting some more information. And basically, that's on the feasibility study that's already been done. Um, I've read it a couple times, I've listened to Clay's talks, I've talked to former board members, and I'm still confused about the viability of this project. And one day I'm thinking, this is gonna be great, and I don't know how much power is gonna generate, are we gonna get six months, eight months, two months? And that's where I thought about getting somebody, there's a lot of people in Clay, give you some names that have been in power generation, maybe they've retired, could read that feasibility study, and sit down with you and go, you know, this is this is the greatest thing since sliced bread, or maybe there's some issues, or you know, just get some input. And maybe you maybe you totally understand it, but I, I don't. I've read it and I'm not taking anything away from Clay, but he's this is his project and he's he's an honorable man and everything, but I just got questions and I'd like to hear it from a third party, somebody that's not a stakeholder. And, and also, the, the community needs to hear that. I mean, my goodness, we couldn't pass a four cents a gallon tax. And the council is even split on it. So if, if we go down, if we, if we continue on this, uh, the geological study, you, if we go with that, if it turns good, if we can safely satisfy some other people's needs, you're still gonna have to bond this with the people and you're gonna have to sell that. You know? And that's gonna be a big hurdle. Um, raise property taxes and other things. And it might be a great project, but you're gonna to have to be able to convey that to people that this is a great project. So that's kind of where I was at. It's, uh, I think it's gonna be a good project if it was built safely and with other issues, but just not sure. I'm not that much, I'm not an electrician, I don't do power generation, so some of that's a little bit hard. So I hope you guys can all understand it. So that was my concerns, and it was really helpful to hear your questions and answers on the water part of it. That's helpful. And there may be some more questions there, but that whole cost benefit, you know, I think you're doing the right thing. I really get nervous too is when we have to approve this tonight, you know? I mean, this building got built, but if you remember, we had to start it before the plans were even done. You know, we don't want to go down that road again with projects. So thank you very much for your time and effort. And, and uh, as Manager CEC, I hope you have the best of luck. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, Wendy Rainey, 2500 Orca Road, uh, The Fatal Flaw. Um, I'd just like to thank you guys for seriously um, looking at all the angles. Um, we appreciate that. Um, to answer your question, um, our season started May 1st. 
and we have had no discussion regarding an impact that a geotech survey would have for us this summer. Um, I can't change the reservations that are here. We're full on, we're in our season. I don't have time to step aside and uh, rework anything for this summer. So we are headed forward. Um, I appreciate um, Council Member Burton stating that um, you know, city money shouldn't be used until everybody's on board. I kind of feel that way too, but uh, um, like I said before, we do want to see uh, alternative energy, energy use, but until um, our concerns are satisfied uh, and our safety is taken into account, we can't be on board with this project. And I appreciate the level of, uh, of thought you've put into it. Um, it's extremely emotional and I appreciate it. Thank you. Are there audience comments? Okay, thank you. Uh, council comments, uh, Councilman Schaefer. Hmm? Oh, congratulations to the water, for the Water Department Award. <laughs> Very well done. Also, congratulations to all the graduating seniors. That's exciting. Um, thanks for coming. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Weiss? Um, just best of luck for our fish and fleet tomorrow. And yeah. Leif and Sam, congratulations on your award. And it sounds like that's not the only thing you're being tasked with and, and going above and beyond with. And anytime I come in, you promptly and professionally. So thank you for being in my place. So that's great. You guys are great. Thank you. Uh, Councilman, I'll go online. Uh, Councilman Allison. Yeah, uh, congratulations to everybody there, and uh, thanks for everybody for putting in the time there, my co-counselors, and uh, thanks to the Rainies there for for staying involved in the whole project, and hopefully we can we can make things work for everybody, or if not, we can. Um, Stop the anyway, thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilman Burton. Uh, no comment. Just thanks to everybody that showed up. Councilman. Oh. Thank you, uh, Councilman Jones. Yeah, I'll thank everybody for, for showing up, participating, and uh, yeah. But, uh, Hey, uh, Councilman Garden. I echo all the comments before me and have no other comment. Thank you. <laughs> Councilman Meyer? Uh, same thing. Uh, echo everyone's comment. And I'm new to council, so I know this Prayer Lake project has kind of been on the radar and there's been a lot of presentations. So I'm trying to catch up on that and try to make a decision that I feel comfortable with. So um, that's it. Okay. Well, thank you, and thank you, Council, and especially ones that will be sitting over net tomorrow. Make sure you catch lots, and make sure it crosses a Cordova dock and generates lots of raw fish tax revenue. <laughs> um, as uh, Clerk um, Bourgeois mentioned, we don't have the uh, executive session. We don't have a legal update for tonight, so there's only one item left on the agenda. Um, motion and second to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Not that it matters. <laughs> we're, we're adjourned.